Hi everyone, I'm Erica Cohn, the director of Belly of the Beast. Thank you all so much for joining this incredible discussion today during opening weekend of the film. If you haven't yet had a chance to see Belly of the Beast, go to bellyofthebeastfilm.com slash watch to purchase a ticket to see the film digitally in partnership with a theater of your choosing. So 50% of your ticket purchase goes to actually support the independent theater during these challenging times and 20% goes to a local reproductive justice, prison abolition, or racial justice organization in the same city as a theater of your choosing. So now here are some opening remarks from the woman who inspired all of our work, this movement, this film, the one and only Dr. Angela Davis. We rarely have the opportunity to follow the trajectory of such an important struggle as the racist inspired forced sterilizations that have taken place within the California prison system. So I wanna take this opportunity to thank Erica Cohn, whose film Belly of the Beast allows us to understand precisely why we insist that while men constitute the majority of those behind walls, we can learn so much more about the nature of the system from incarcerated women, despite their numerical minority. As someone who has watched the development of Justice Now since it was created, I am so proud uh, uh, that Justice Now supported Kelly Dillon and that Kelly Dillon had the fortitude to fight this battle after being in an abusive relationship and after having been sent to prison for killing a partner who would have otherwise killed her, she was the target of an assault on her body and, her, and an assault on her reproductive rights. She fought back with justice now, Cindy Chandler, Robin Levy, and all the others who pursued this issue. This film is being released precisely at the moment when we need it. It provides us with the best evidence of why we are calling for abolition of the repressive apparatuses of the state, prisons, immigrant detention facilities, structures of policing. Thank you so much, Dr. Angela Davis, for joining us. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's panel, law professor, advocate, and author of Policing the Womb, Invisible Women and the Criminalization of Motherhood, whose work deeply influenced our filmmaking process, Dr. Michelle Goodwin. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is my pleasure to be with you. Uh, what an amazing panel that we have today. And we're gonna jump right on in and get started. I wanna introduce the panelists and ask them to come on live with me. We're joined today by Don Wooten, is a licensed practical nurse and is an ice whistleblower. She came forward with allegations of mass hysterectomies performed on immigrant detainees uh, at the Irwin County Detention Center, ICDC in Georgia. We're also joined by Kelly Dillon. She's a film participant in Belly of the Beast and so absolutely courageous. Kelly, I'm so happy that you're with us. She's the co-chairperson of the Empowerment Congress Southeast Neighborhood Council. She is a survivor of domestic violence, gang violence, and an advocate for violence prevention and intervention programs. She is now the vice president of the Empowerment Congress Southeast Neighborhood Council and newly appointed commissioner and board member of the Department of Community and Family Services. We're also joined by Danielle Rodriguez. And before you all came on, we were feeling the spirit so you all be with us because it's live it's happening and Danielle is the Georgia coordinator for Sister Song the National Women of Reproductive Justice Collect Collective her work centers black women black trans and black queer women and people and supports using the human rights framework towards liberation further she serves on the Community National Advisory Council in Reproductive Health Equity and Birth Justice and Black Mama Matters Alliance, which is a powerful organization. Also joined by Lady Mansfield. She is the Organizing Programs Director with Project South. She is a journalist, organizer, activist, and strategist for social change. 
born and raised in South Georgia. She is the founder of Hello Racism and mentored young women of the Southern Rural Black Women Initiative. And finally, also joined by Cynthia Chandler. She's a film participant as well in Belly of the Beast. Cynthia has dedicated her life to achieving gender and racial justice while challenging violence in all of its forms, including imprisonment. She co-founded Critical Resistance and Justice Now, early prison industrial complex abolitionist organizations influencing Black Lives Matter network. She uncovered California's coercive sterilization of women in, in prisons and has led efforts to pass successful legislation to stop it. And she's received numerous awards for her work. I couldn't be happier than to be joined by this amazing panel and group of folks. And so we're going to dive right in. And so uh, just in starting, we were talking about um, lifting up ancestors before we began, about the importance of thinking about Harriet Tubman, what a warrior she happened to be, taking many trips south to rescue people from, their, from slavery, from kidnap, and so much more, and she was stealth as she did so. That really describes everybody on this panel today, truly stealth people who've given their lives to helping others. And so I want to start our conversation today with Kelly and Don, and I'm going to first turn to you, Kelly. For people who've not seen the film yet, can you tell us about your story? What happened to you which led you to being a participant in this film? Yes. So um, thank you so much. And I just want to once again tell the panelists and all these brilliant minds and um, courageous people that I thank you for rallying around me, rallying around our team. I just got to give another shout out. But um, I was around 23, I'll say around 23 years old when I began to experience um, just some abnormal, um, you know, monthly cycles. I had some, you know, pain, some bad cramping. And so we have well, I was incarcerated at the time. So I was not, I, I became incarcerated when I was 19 years old, um, as you shared. And I was, I don't know, I, I just felt like something was going on with me. So I sought the doctor. And I just want to let you guys know that it's only like one gynecologist for 4,000 women in the, um, in prison in the state of California. So I had to go see the gynecologist and upon one of those uh, visits, he told me that I might have um, abnormal cells. You know, I didn't know what that meant at the time, what was abnormal cells, but then he said that those abnormal cells can lead to cancer. And so he asked me if I wanted to, um, would I consent to a cone biopsy? And so he also gave me an ultrasound and he said that I had some cysts on my ovaries. And so they were going to remove the cysts and then they were going to do a cone biopsy to check for cancer. And so, um, of course, you know, any woman or anybody who hears cancer, they're like, okay, you know, hur hurry up and help me. I don't want to die. I don't want to have to suffer through cancer. And so um, I was sentenced. I mean, I was, excuse me, I wasn't sentenced. I was... Uh, redirected to the surgeon. And so upon that pre-op conversation, he asked me, he said, well, do you want to have more kids? And of course, I'm 23 years old. You know, I, I've been tragically separated from my own two children. And so I was looking forward to either being a mother or being a mother again. So I said, yeah, sure. Like, uh, yeah, I want to have more kids. So he said, okay, and wrote it down. And I really at that moment felt that because the gynecologist was African-American, the surgeon was African himself. And so I, I felt a little bit more um, safe that they were respecting me as an African-American woman and that I didn't have to, you know, worry about that. I felt like I had connected to them. And when I went into surgery, there was a whole other agenda that was um, already in the works. And so upon that surgery, um, he went in and he um, immediately cut the blood supply to my ovaries, killing them, and then began to perform 
not so much a cone biopsy or the removal of the cyst, but he began to perform at that moment what led to my sterilization. And so um, coming out of it, about a month, it was about a month later, I was waiting to, you know, for my menstrual cycle to start, in which it didn't. And then I began to start um, experiencing what I now know to be menopausal sim symptoms, high flashes, heart palpitations, um, feeling of like I was losing my mind. And then I began to say, no, something is wrong. Something happened to me. And from that time on, it took me about four, uh, took me about two or three more months to even see the doctor again. And then um, when people start to see me lose weight, start to see these things happening to me, couldn't sleep at night, they said, no, Kelly, they're not helping you. And then they began to tell me about Cynthia Chandler, who was already in our um in our prison, helping the women who were HIV positive and who had hepatitis and these chronic illnesses that wasn't receiving medical care either. So even I, you know, even though I did not have HIV or any of those chronic illnesses, but I still took a chance on seeing if she would see me, you know, for what what happened to me. And she and her team, they did. And what a tragedy! Because you were in your early twenties when this happened. Mm -hmm. and you had no idea this is a good time to actually remind our audience about the united states history with eugenics and forced sterilization practices right so 1927 the united states supreme court upheld the virginia law that provided for the forced sterilization of people who were considered to be morally or socially or physically or mentally unfit and it was based on a case that involved a poor 16-year-old white girl who had had a baby out of wedlock, um, out of a rape. And the Supreme Court said that better than to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations are enough. The court compared snipping a woman's fallopian tubes to vaccination. And it was after that that Nazi Germany adopted the very law that the Supreme Court upheld in the United States. I want to take this opportunity to um, bring Don Wooten into this story as well. As you all know, Don bravely came forward to tell a story about what was happening in ICE detention centers. Don, can you tell us a bit about why you came forward and what it was that you came forward with? I had been in um, out of Irwin County Detention Center um, over the course of 2010 uh, up until July of 2020. Um, there and listening to, um, I want to say, Miss Kelly's story, um, retro back to the young lady that was 23 years old, um, detained immigrant at the time, that approached me building a working relationship on the inside i've always been um and i say this all the time i've always been a remote rebel <laughs> um my mom I, i'm the child that you ask her you know out of her three kids which one would you have the most problems with um i can admit that but in a good way but when she come to me she came to me maybe and then earlier on in the prison system. I hadn't been a nurse, correctional nurse long. Um, I graduated December of 2009, first job March there of 2010. Um, and corrections is a special place to work for nurses. You know, it's something that you have to love to do and have a compassion and a drive to do. Um, working there maybe two years in, um, nine months the first time, two years in the second time this young lady comes to me at 23 years old and she says nurse Wooten, can I see you for a minute and I was like sure what what have I done and she was like no I just want to talk to you for a minute um and she come to me and we sat down I was a sick call nurse at the time and we sat down and she began to tell me that she had been out for a procedure it was not explained to her um, she was just told to sign a form, and when she come out from up under anesthesia, she knew that she was hurting really bad. But she come to me sometime later after the procedure, and, and 
in her having that hysterectomy, 23, here or originated orange, her home was in Mexico. She said, I think my husband's gonna leave me. And I asked her, I said, why do you think he's gonna leave you? She said, because I can't bear any more children. And that is what we were talking about having kids. I don't know how to tell him I can't have kids. So progression from two years to being gone four years to coming back four years later, this term in October of 20, um, 19 until July of 2020, I get 20 plus women at various times hearing about, you can go to Miss Wooten, you can talk to Miss Wooten, and coming and asking over the course of time saying, hey, Miss Wooten, um, I had this procedure. Can you find out why I had this procedure? Or I had to sign a paper and I didn't know what was happening to me at the time, coming to me saying that, you know, I had a hysterectomy. Why did I have this hysterectomy? Why did I have this tube ligation? Why did I have my ovaries removed? Um, I started out in the year with COVID. COVID hit us about February and the prison was, we're not talking about it. In other words, you're not talking that we have it here. We don't have it. You're not going to say we have it here. I carry sickle cell from birth. My kids are asthmatics. I have underlying conditions. My physician tells me into getting sick in March that my COVID test was negative, And I was told it probably was a false positive, a false negative because I was short of breath. I had chest pain. Um, I had fluid on the left lung. I had breathing treatments. You know, I wound up with an inhaler and I was told that I couldn't bring those inhalation treatments inside the facility because it would release that mist um, with everybody else and they would become contaminated, keep in mind that I don't have COVID, but I'm having to be told that I have to come to work. So at some point, somebody was afraid that I had something that was contagious. From them not giving us proper PPE to where we were buying our own personal cloth mask um, that were not lined, that were not CDC approved. But because we're essential workers and I'm an African-American single parent of five children. I have to work. So now I'm being told that I have to come to work sick. Um, not only sick, but not knowing if I have to bring COVID that's in this facility back to my children. Right, and right. then the ladies coming to me at the same time saying they've had these awful procedures. And I don't know what compels people to seek me out over the time, even from a little girl over the time, people would seek me out with personal problems. And I began to accept that maybe this is my calling. Maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. So I began to ask questions to my supervisor about a detainee that had a fever that another nurse was supposed to have taken his temperature and said it was 97.8. When I took it, it was 101.8. Me and her had a conversation about, hey, she couldn't have took it. I'm standing here watching her. She never left her office. I've done her job. It has not been taken. 30 minutes into that conversation, I left my supervisor, went and took this detainee's temperature. Again, it's 101.8. And then I got the rationale to where, oh, they know how to wrap up in those covers. Everybody's watching the news. From my supervisor that I'm supposed to take instruction from, that's higher ranked than I am, that they know how to build their body temperature up. Oh, everybody wants COVID. I'm sick. So if this is COVID that I have, it hasn't taken my life at this time, but COVID was claiming lives. It was not just making people sick. So when I begin to ask questions and I begin to come into work on the days that I was scheduled for, full-time job, 40 hour a week is how I fed my kids, had no outside resources. So when I began to press those questions and ask those questions, my supervisor went to a counterpart. They come together, two sisters came together, wrote me up, had me demoted. So now I need those questions. And then you came forward. And at what point did you decide, okay, now is the time that I'm going to come forward? When I became a nurse, I took my licensure serious. And when I come to work, I struggle for my nursing license. Briefly, my son was 12 years old. I could tell it now he's 22. My oldest babysat, a 12-year-old babysat, an eight-year-old and a four-year-old with no home phone and no rationale and no reason to keep him uh, to know if they were going to be alive or somebody would call me and say, hey, your house is caught on fire. Because he's 12. Right. At the time. And he's keeping my eight 
and four-year-old. I struggled as a single mom to become a nurse. That was my life's dream. That was what I desired to do to, as a child, that innate ability to be able to care and speak up. I stayed in trouble in school for speaking up for other students in school, even growing up. So <laughs> once I found out that that was compromised and you no longer cared about my life and I'm supposed to be a part of the team, and you and didn't care about you came forward. I realized at this point that these detainees that are detained, their lives didn't matter either. If I'm a part of the team mm -hmm. and there was no regard for my safety or my sanity. So I could only imagine. Thank you so much for that, Don. I really appreciate that. Well, we're also joined by is what you're sharing and what Kelly has shared is, is something that comes together, right? It's sort of as Kelly has shared that there were people who were engaged in medical neglect and even worse, right? In terms of the uh, coerced, forced, unbeknownst to you sterilization. And it's really interesting that in a time in which the election is coming up, you know, it was um, Fannie Lou Hamer who used the term Mississippi appendectomy to describe what was happening to little black girls all over the South as young as 10, 11 years old, being forcibly sterilized, no idea that they were, parents having no idea. And at a certain point, you know, this has just affected so many women, you know, at a certain point, a third of the women in Puerto Rico sterilized, indigenous women, so many black women. And so I want to turn to Danielle and Lady because of their work um, on the ground, working in reproductive justice matters, trying to lift up these narratives. So, Danielle, I'm going to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about how you connect then and your work and the work of Sister Song connects to what it is that we've just heard so far from on? I can, and thank you so much, Kelly and Don, for sharing your stories with us again. I think it's important um, for more folks to come out. There's a lot of stories out there, so um, you, you, you all are pioneers and you always wonder why people come to you. Maybe this is why, maybe this is the reason. Um, Sister Song defines reproductive justice as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy the human right to have children, the human right to not have children, and the human right to parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. Reproductive justice and human rights are a complementary framework. My work as the Georgia State Coordinator is more focused on organizing folks in their communities to challenge structural power inequalities in a comprehensive and transformative process that involves engagement with the community to ensure our advocacy efforts are for the betterment of them and their families. This, uh, one of our founding mothers um, summarized reproductive justice as um, the complete physical, mental, spiritual, political, social, environmental, and economic well being of women and girls, including cis, trans, gender, non conforming folks, based on the full achievement and protection of women's human rights. So, once we get the word of what's happening at the, this detention center, um, it's a reproductive justice issue. It becomes um, something um, that we we had to get involved with, and uh, we have, we um, spoke with Project South, who gave us their toolkit. We amplified all of their work, and then we put out an RJ statement um, that received over eight thousand signatures um, from across the, the world, actually, um, in support of these whistleblowers. So. Um, that's pretty much where we, we started. And I can go down a list of things that we we're also doing. I'm sure we'll have more questions about that later, but just wanted to kind of ground us in what reproductive justice is. And so that's so important. I'm gonna to turn to you too, Lady, to, to tell us more about your work and how it fits with this and to remind our viewers that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A because we will definitely try to get to those. Yeah, thank you, um, and thank you all, and to just Don and Kelly, as said, um, it, you all represent so many women that have come before us that are in the present, and hopefully the representation is also something that will stop some of the things that have been happening to our bodies to those that will come after us, right. and how it could 
how it has connected to our work. Um, as said with Ms. Don Wooden, we've been working in detention centers for a few years now, but more so than that for over 30 years, we've been working in what we consider the global south. And a lot of that deals with the culture of who we are, but it also connects back to the land. And when we think about that connection, our bodies as um, different cultures of groups that have passed this land has come in different ways in different ways. And so one of the things that we've been able to do is also pay attention to those culture stories and narratives from the folks with communities we're working in. And of course, at the center of all of those communities are women. They are black women, they are indigenous women, they are Latino women, they are women of, of European uh, ancestral. And so in that, we have to acknowledge what it is that our bodies have come through, gone through, and where our bodies have landed up on that. And so our work takes in that in consideration in everything that we do, whether it we're talking about what has been there politically, whether we're talking about medicine and the healthcare system, um, whether we are talking about what has happened in terms of organizing. And when you said eugenics, the 1927 ruling, it also goes back to now at that point, we are talking about within those cultures, the story we have passed down from lineage you know, when we look at the early 1900s, there's an effort to stop reproduction, which comes from all of the women that I'm talking about. But before that, for African women, there was an effort to continue reproduction more so, to where we have even rape happening and other things because the children were represented, representation of a workforce, of a capitalist system that we are building. And so how we, in, how the, we include reproductive justice in our work is also looking at the culture of who we are as women and folks coming across the land and what those stories and narratives are. And we can't help but stand in the truth of that like with Kelly and Don and the women that are in the detention centers to say, this must be a part of the work, that reproductive justice cannot be separate and stand alone because it is a part of our story. And so that's how it's tied in and that's why we continue to do this work through Don, you all, sister song, um, and just how we're gonna continue to do it for the future until we don't have to do this work anymore because that's the goal. All right, so the, so now let's get into the thick of it. So Cynthia, your work, you know, as Kelly said, you were already uh, there in the jails helping out other women in the prison and she was able to turn to you. Um, tell us about that work and then moving forward because you and Kelly have been working on rep, uh, reparations for women who've had these experiences in California. So give us some sense about what's going on there. Sure. So. You know, Justice Now was founded in 2000. I'm a co-founder along with a brilliant attorney named Cassandra Shaler. And we really founded the organization in collaboration with activists inside California's women's prisons who composed our original governing board. Um, so all of our work has always been, uh, has always involved the leadership and guidance of people inside. Um, and when Kelly reached out, I mean, I just, I want to say that you know, Kelly and I met each other now about 20 years ago. So this has been sort of a 20 year effort. The film covers that whole period. The film took about 10 years to make, um, but we've been working on this for 20 years. And when Kelly and I met each other, we met because I had gotten and been able to review her medical records and needed to go into prison and sit down with her and tell her that she had been sterilized and everyone had been lying to her about what had happened. Um, and you were the first to tell her, like as yeah, an official. Yeah. Right. Well, as, as anyone, anyone. Right. right? So that, that's a, and you're not a doctor. No. And, and mind you, that was 20 years ago. So we were both young women. We've sort of grown up with each other, frankly. And, um, part, it, it, no human should ever have to tell another human something like that, especially when meeting. It's just, it's wrong. Uh, it was a life changing experience for us both, even for me as, as a form of secondary learning, right. Uh, of this tragedy. What was also really key, and I just want to emphasize this about Kelly as an activist, what was also really key to me in that moment was that even then in her grief of suddenly learning this, Kelly was also able to say, hey, 
you know, what's going on that you as a white woman, we're both young women here, but you as a white woman, you, you're a lawyer and you were able to sit down and read these medical records and you have more knowledge about my body than I do. Right. And, um, and that was I so did feel true. That. When, when she said that to you, what, what were you thinking? I'm telling you my, my what you were feeling at that yeah. time too, Kelly. Yeah. It's, for real, I, I thought, damn, she's a strong woman. I mean, she's just putting this out there. I mean, like, honestly, that was, that was part of what I was thinking. And, and I, to have integrity as a white person, it was necessary for me to affirm that, right? It was necessary for me to say, yeah, this is, we are in a completely messed up situation here. It is wrong. And what I did then was I made a promise to Kelly that I would make sure she got all the tools I had to be able to read this, to be able to understand it and to move forward. And, you know, Kelly then took that knowledge and it was like a catalyst. She started training up other people. She, you know, she teamed up with our human rights director at Justice Now, Robin Leedy. They created, they really developed a whole human rights documentation program. We trained over a hundred people in California's women's prisons on human rights law and the documentation process. And we started interviewing every pregnant person in the California prison system to see if they were interviewed, if they had been asked if they wanted to be sterilized, we started seeking out other people who might have gone through abdominal surgeries like Kelly and maybe were unbeknownst to them sterilized. And it was really because Kelly was willing to, uh, in the face of tragedy, say not only no, I'm not gonna accept this for myself, but I'm gonna empower everyone else, that this whole effort and this whole campaign was birthed. Um, and I, I just, I want to add one more point in, which is that, you know, at the time when this was going on, you know, for, for the first 10 years, this is now a 20 year effort, for the first 10 years, any time that Kelly and I or anyone else brought up the idea of eugenics, we were kind of met with a reaction as if we had three heads. You know, the, the term eugenics was so out of the lexicon, even of, for activists, that when I would say the word eugenic, people would frequently think I was saying utopic. And I was like, no, I'm not. Nothing like, utopic about this. <laughs> Nothing utopic at all about this. Nothing exactly. utopic about the mass incarceration of women exactly. of color and nothing about robbing exactly. them of their reproductive resources. You know, a, a very uh, celebrated man activist challenging imprisonment at the time and also working on behalf of gender justice said to me, you know, when you bring up this word eugenics, it's just like bringing up the word vagina. It just, I just don't get it, right? So it was, you know, we were at a time where no one remembered that history, which is part of the lack of accountability for this gross set of abuses that's happened historically that has led it to proliferate. And, and to Dawn, I just want to say thank you for your courage. When I heard what you said, it was so earth shattering, not because it was unexpected, it was earth shattering because the stories were so similar, almost verbatim similar to the abuses we documented in California's prisons. I have no doubt that this is happening across the country in lockups of all kinds. Um, and I feel very strongly that this is part of a pattern of rising fascism. It's part of a history of enslavement to control people's ability to have connection to culture and to have a future. It is also part of the rise of white supremacy and white nationalism to perpetuate this desire to have a master let's, race. Let's get back to that because I want to bring you back into this, Kelly, and to, to talk a bit more about the efforts that you have going forward. I mean, it's what we just heard from Cynthia. Can, only imagine what it was that you felt having to learn about your own health from this young white woman who's working in the prisons and that that's how you found out about your own health and if you could tell us just a little bit about that and then also about the reparations efforts that you're working on now thank you so much thank you cynthia um um, uh, give me a moment because hearing it over again is very traumatizing for me. I'm so sorry. Um, I know it's been 20 years and it's been for the last two or three months that I've actually had to speak out publicly. So hearing it from someone else is, is still heavy for me. So, so just give me a moment. But going back into that time, um, it, it, it made me aware of my lack of education. It made me aware 
of my lack of resources, my accessibility to them at the time. It's so many different layers. I come from South Central Los Angeles, born and raised in Watts, you know, in that area. And so it was just in the terminology and the different things that I just felt like it was, we were just in two different worlds that she was able to read something that I could not understand myself. And so I was angry about that. And then I became pissed off is that it can it, it, it I became pissed off because then at that moment I realized that they had used my ignorance against me. Including black people, which was exactly. important to note too. Exactly. Right? But people get exactly. in the systems, right? Right. Just the whole just just in, in, in just in general, that they were using our ignorance against us. And and we and to make us easy targets and victims of this plan or this agenda that they had, and um and so with that like in, in that anger is what like she said catapulted me into saying no something has to be done, but it wasn't until we began to work on my situation that I was sitting there and I began to watch women come back from the infirmary holding their abdomens, holding their stomachs, at, and they were 20, 23, 30 years old. And I said, hey, what's, what's, what happened to you? They was like, oh, they gave me a hysterectomy. Oh, they gave me, they said they had to remove my ovaries. I was like, for what? They said I had abnormal cells. And so as I was moving forward and Cynthia and the team was medically educating me on options of treatment and different things like that, that I begin to see, wait, wait a minute, hold up, it's something, it's something else deeper going on here. And then um, I, I said, well, do you mind talking to someone about it? And then that's when it clicked, like, wait a minute, there's an agenda that's happening here. And we need, and, 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 and I don't know, I, I just didn't know at the time how we were going to move forward. But I knew that as each person that I met, I was going to, I was sending them to justice now. And so I can't even tell you how many countless interviews and pulling them out. It was, it was a really strong allyship. Um, it was almost like the Underground world, Railroad. There was an operation that was happening. I don't want to get too technical because I don't know how it would come back on the team. But at the same time, it was really like this underground system that was happening in order to funnel um, the victims, um, get the, the uh, medical records, figure out what was happening, to do these surveys and create these Which surveys. Which you all had to do. Yes. Right? That was put upon you to have to do to ferret right. out what was right. going on under. Right. So, so I'm, I, when you said that something sparked into me is that it's going to always be upon us to fight for our freedom. I cannot rely, just like I, I put my, I would never again put my livelihood and my freedom in someone else's hands. And so, therefore, it will always be upon us to go after that which is rightfully ours. We cannot trust this government, we cannot trust this system in order to wish it for us, to, to want it for us. Because as you stated, Ms. Ms. Goodwin, and as everyone on this panel has stated, it has been centuries in which we have seen that this, this governmental system does not want to give it to us. Well, you know, on that point, it was Sojourner Truth in 1851 in that famous speech, Ain't I a Woman speech, most people think about it that she's talking about chivalry, that nobody opens up a carriage door for her. But what is often overlooked is that she said, and I bore 13 children and nearly each one snatched from my arms and nobody heard my cry but God, ain't I a woman? So for people who think, well, that's just hyperbole, we can go way back to see what has happened to the lives of indigenous women in this country and also African-American women um, who are in this country. So I wanna open it up to, to, to everybody here. What does this all represent? You know, turn on your mics. What, what, when you hear what it is that we've just heard from Kelly and when you hear what we've heard from Don, what is your thinking about where we are in terms of reproductive health rights and justice for Black women in the United States? Anybody can click on and begin. 
Well, I'll just say is that when I, even though I thought that we had made this progress on our end, but when Don and, and all the stuff that happened in Georgia came forward, then I realized that we are moving backwards. And we have, and even though we've seen like we've made some progress over here, but it just seemed like we are still stuck. We are still stuck. Mm -hmm. And it, it, even though I was happy to hear that they were fighting over on that side, but then at the same time, it made me almost discouraged that the fact that we are still in this war, you know, so I, I can just say that. Kind of like a war on the body. Right. Don, were you going to say something? I think that you were unmuted. We were in, um, lady, like she said earlier, can detest because we come from deep south. We're deep southern and we're in a place to where the facility um, that I worked at, you know, it is 90% African American, 10% minority. Um, that works in this facility. So it's still in this camp that I work. It's like you take orders from the head down and we're still li living in that slave mentality system to where if John owned it, and, and I don't mean any disregard to anybody, then if John had children, he's going to seek out his children to carry on the same attributes that he was taught to carry on and so suppression is handed down from lineage to lineage and generation to generation and whenever you do find people that come along to assist us of another race as african americans you know it's it's and i was listening to um kelly's story she had to find out if i'm not mistaken from miss cynthia that's how she found out. Education is still not handed to us the way that it's handed to our counterparts. Um, if my mom was a teacher and I'm looking at this and I'm seeing this, then my daughter goes on to school to become a teacher and then her children are to become a teacher. If her mom was taught in the area of racism and taught to in the area of suppression, then here comes my kids up under the area still in that stereotypical stamina of racism and hey, we're only gonna let you get so far on the spectrum or you can only get so far in this prison system, you're only gonna get so far there as an African-American individual. And when we come to a place as African-American, like I say, women, there are two African-American women that were my supervisors. So when you come to hold, in order to hold this position, you're suppressed to hold this position or you can't eat. So that means that everybody up under you, you're going to suppress. So it's like you're training me um, to be suppressed by my own kind. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We come deep south. So I, I agree totally. And, and, lady we had a conversation you know about coming to this for me because it's hard to talk about and you know it's hard but we're still being taught violence in the land and you handle here in the deep south if you're not of, of a certain ethnicity because you have that education even if you do have it then you can't utilize it because of the color of your skin mm -hmm. so we are we are backwards Thank you so much for sharing that. Those interwoven systems of oppression that you're talking about. Lady, I see that you're unmuted. You yeah, something? so um, I definitely am right there with um, Ms. Wooten, Ann, and Kelly. I also feel, um, I feel hopeful. And I feel like I'm looking at this and on my screen, I switched devices and I'm looking at for beautiful faces <laughs> of four black women. And that for me is like, yes, it can feel like we're going backwards, but what's also happening is that more of us are stepping up and we're taking those spirits from behind. Cause I think some of this is a spirituality journey about who we are, who we are, and what we have control of. So I am hopeful because I see us saying no, Miss Wooten represents someone that came from the same system she's talking about that said no, that got a degree from that system that said, okay, I authorize you to go into it 
you can do this. That also said to that same system that said, I can take it away from you. No, I will stand with the other women here. I will tell my story. I will call it out. And so that part of me, um, seeing that makes me feel like too, we are moving in the right direction even though it feels like we're not. And I think part of that feeling is the more we move in that direction and push back as women, mm -hmm. because when you said Black women, I believe in, in a lot of our work shows um, at Project South that we are amongst those that are attacked the most. Like if you can take out it, I mean women as a whole, but we know that there's some narrative in our story that also speaks to what it means to us now. And so the more I see see us even the more I see us coming out we have to also know those attacks are going to get more <laughs> they're going to come tighter they're going to come stronger because we're challenging power and power that has existed and said I want you to feel helpless that's right hopeless. and so I feel encouraged and this is a sign that we're moving in the right direction things are shifting and changing and we're just going to hit some robot a uh, road bumps along the way but look at where we are now and there are real histories there. So Cynthia, I see that you're unmuted and I wanna put a question out um, for you all too about the movement for decarceration and anti-shackling. Um, but I'd also like to weave it in too about disabilities, like individuals with disabilities behind bars and how these narratives affect them because oftentimes people who are living with disabilities uh, are ignored, right? But in the carceral system there are lots of folks who are living um with disabilities so anyway so cynthia i don't know if you wanted to speak to that at all but i'd love it if you touched on it yeah so first i would just want to say um lady i'm so happy you said that you feel hope i i actually hope that this film belly of the beast um despite its horrible subject um is actually uplifting in that it models how we all can make change like all of us have power all of you watching today we have power if we team up together and we have resiliency and we just stick with it we can make change in the world um and i also want to specifically speak to white people in the audience as the white person on this panel i think it's incredibly important to recognize that white supremacy is not going away until white people allow it to go away and and start becoming allies in this struggle um, and it's so important for white people to start being accountable for systemic racism the kind of systemic racism that then puts pressure on people of color who are in these roles as doctors to act out the agenda of the state and i want to say i i read i heard this most upsetting interview with a reporter on NPR a couple weeks ago, taking back her systemic analysis of what happened with the ICE sterilizations and saying, no, she was wrong. It was really just one back, bad actor who was corrupt. That is so wrong because the reason it was allowed to go on for so long was because of the vulnerable position that women of color are in in that institution, as well as the vulnerable position people are in in our prisons. And that is compounded by gender, by race, by disability, by uh, you know sexual orientation, by gender, like it's it, it, all these different layers of oppression come together. And there's a reason that folks who are already oppressed are disproportionately in these institutions caged, right? They're brought in there systematically and then face reproductive oppression even through the caging of folks. Let's just be clear that putting people in detention facilities, putting people in prisons, putting people also in mental hospitals forces people away from their communities and acts as a form of reproductive oppression of those entire oh, yeah. communities, right? Away from their children, mm -hmm. away from and, the family. I mean, the, the yeah. history behind this, right? I mean, let's be clear, we're living in a system where post-slavery, the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery, also permits it so long as you're convicted of a crime. Right. And let's be exactly. clear that when that was ratified, the South created all sorts of laws it did not have during slavery. To release black people from slavery, the South created all sorts of laws that would make people a convict. And that led to slavery being more robust in this new system after the abolition than it was before. 
right? right. I mean, so there's, we need another panel next weekend. We need to get um, that together. Can again. I add one thing about the reparations? I never Absolutely. really answered that, which is that, look, I think justice, and I learned this from working with people in prison. We did a whole series of, of interviews to try to assess what people in women's prisons who have experienced violence and also have committed crimes, right? what they themselves would define as a real system of justice. What they came up with was three elements. One is that there's an acknowledgement, actual acknowledgement and naming of harms. Two is that there's actual safety, that people are removed from a situation of harm and provided safety. And the third is atonement. If you don't have actual atonement by the harm doer, you're never gonna actually effectuate change. And the reparations movement, and I encourage folks to go to the Belly of the Beast website, which is bellyofthebeastfilm.com, you can sign our petition to get reparations for people in California for the history of eugenics and the contemporary sterilizations in California. But what it also does is it forces, it would force the state, what we're proposing is to force the state to actually identify and notify the people that it harmed, the people that it sterilized. Because there are most, people who still may not know, right? Most, pro most probably don't know. Um, and like Kelly, it was done during abdominal surgeries or it was done while people are having C-sections and people just don't know. It would force them to notify it. And we feel really strongly that just like we keep seeing police murders over and over every day in our country, if we don't have atonement, this is not going to end. And forcing the state to recognize what it did, acknowledge what it did, apologize for what it did, tell people that they and come forward and fess up to having sterilized people and then compensating people. Unless we do that, we're bound, in, bound to have this repeat itself again. We can see it repeating itself with COVID and the you know, encouragement of people who are medically, uh, medically vulnerable, as right. well as elders to sacrifice themselves to the economy. That's a form of eugenics, uh, right? Exactly. And, and, and it has course, to stop. And many people don't think about the number of elderly folks who are behind bars. Danielle, yeah. I see that you unmuted. Yeah, I just, I, I think it's important. I, this, is, this is just an amazing panel. Um, I want to acknowledge um, capitalism. Um, I think that we need to bring that into the conversation as well, because people are getting paid for doing these procedures. Um, yeah. I here in Georgia, I'm actually from New York, um, and I'm now here in Georgia, and there's a large, uh, I'm sorry, a small but mighty underground community midwife alliance here. Um, and I learned that in 1875, um, the American Medical Association launched a um, dirty finger campaign on community midwives yes. so that they could bring in who midwives who are actually giving full spectrum reproductive health care um, so that they could bring that into the hospital. So this was a campaign that they had already put out so that they could profit off of women having babies in hospitals, women getting procedures done so that they can test on us. So, you know, it's, it's so important to me that we acknowledge that you know, this is very much about money. This is very much about where the money is going. Um, and and that's, that's, that's part of the work that we have to do. We have to start, you know, following the money and dismantling as we go. Um, Kelly, why don't you jump right on in there that I'm gonna turn to my last question as we begin to wrap okay. up. Can you believe that? Yes, it was, it went quick, it went so quick, quick, but. I, I, but I just want to kind of piggyback a little bit on what um, Danielle was saying is that that's the reason why like my organization and the people that I work with in the community, we, we take that power back of educating our own of also I know that you have some you have a book I believe is like criminalizing motherhood. Yeah, and that is yeah. something that has been done in the African American community or communities of colors is trying to make them feel good. there we go police in the womb. <laughs> And then so um, about um, and how Afri in that Planned Parenthood agenda, and so we I go I walk I go to schools high schools because those young women um, 
birth control are being pushed up on them and they're starting to have reproductive issues due to the types of birth control and the parents not even knowing that the children are on it. So there's so many different layers. It's not just, I just don't want to think about just incarceration, but there's so many different um, layers in, in different institutions and government institutions and medical uh, fields that the, these agendas are playing out in. You know, and so I just wanted to make that clear and also to 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 address the disability. We we have partnered up with the California Latina Reproductive Justice Project, and they have also while we were fighting for reparations and for justice for those that behind prison correctional walls, they are fighting for justice for those who have been um, sterilized that were uh, women of disabilities um, and out of color behind mental health institutional walls. So we have come together to seek that for our California survivors. Thank you so much for that. So this, is, this comes to the time of the, the wrap up question for you all, which is what can people do to be helpful, to engage in this space? What would you recommend? So I have a list. Um, so I was just going to jump in and just dive in um, because um, our communities pretty much rise up to to this. Um, so first things first is we have a justice statement um, on organizing faith and church leaders, bringing them into this conversation on reproductive rights, justice and health so that we have our um, leaders in our communities having these conversations with the community. Uh, we have our um, survey that we're about to launch for actual patients. So we have, we hear stories of women thinking they have fertility issues. We're teaching them how to request records, request their medical record, see if something possibly did happen to them. We also have a survey for actual nurses and practitioners for them to complete the survey and let us know what injustices that they see happening in their communities. Um, I'm going to give you one more because we're going to be running out of time. We're gonna I'm about to together. give you the last, the last one is like our healing, our healing justice campaign that we have. It is to protect whistleblowers, it's to protect nurses, it's protect doctors, anyone that comes forward, any of these detainees that are, are finally freed. We have a healing justice program so that we can keep them safe and so that we can help them heal. Thank you, Danielle. You rock on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, lady, what can folks do? Yes, so I'm going to drop down our um, social media and website because that'll take you to some things directly around Ms. Wooten case with the work around detention centers, um, but also the Southern Movement Assembly, which is a process. So this ties to what we can do. Let's learn as much knowledge as we can about history because that helps us understand where we are. Those links will take you to some of that, but learn that go ask your mama, your grandmama, your auntie, all your folks about that history uh, and even your history of where you're come. It's gonna take you to some places that you're like, oh, wait a minute. It will take you back to capitalism, to white supremacy, to where we are right now. And you will better understand it. That's part of what we do with popular education. So I put the links there not to take time, but, mm -hmm. but ladies, learn that history. Ask our folks, start documenting, pass it down. We're gonna make some connections. There you go, all right. Uh, Miss Dawn, what can people do? They can be like you. Um, briefly, here, um, speaking from a Southern aspect, had I never listened, had I never slowed down to take time enough to hear them out, and just because my truth is my truth, it did not make me not believe that their truth was their truth. So just take others' truth into perspective, put yourself in somebody else's shoes, Put yourself in that position as I did myself and have a voice that sometimes you have to go against the grain. So we're living in a time now to where you just have to leap out. There's a leap of faith that I took in listening and hearing. And first of all, as women, we have to honor us. If we begin to honor us and we continue to honor who we are and honor where we come from and honor um, our beliefs and stick to those, then we can cause there to be greater movements, even in movements that we are now. So that listening aspect and taking somebody else's truth for what it is. Thank you so much. Cynthia. 
Um, folks can, uh, I'm not muted anymore, right? Folks can watch the film, Belly of the Beast at bellyofthebeastfilm.com. Um, if, if you watch it now, uh, half of the proceeds help support independent theaters, but 20% of the proceeds go to grassroots, reproductive justice, racial justice, and anti-prison organizations in the locality of the theater you pick. So if you want to support grassroots efforts in your area, pick a theater where you are. If you don't see one and you know of groups who need to be funded, contact the film staff, write us a query through it. We'll see if we can pass get another theater involved. So that's what I encourage you to do. Yeah. And Kelly, Miss Kelly, what do you recommend? Um, this is all I'm recommending. This I'm speaking to the survivors. I just want to let you know that you are not alone. Do not be ashamed. It was not your fault. This this happened to you. And that just to know that you can take your power back and there's life, there's love, mm -hmm. and there's family on the other side of this. So I just want to just wrap my arms around my fellow sisters that are um, going through this right now. Thank you so much. I have been so honored, so pleased, so blessed to be with you all today. This incredible group of women who with courage and integrity and perseverance have come to us today and with great empathy for others. I am just so grateful to have been a part of this conversation and I look forward to us doing more of this together and for the strength of this film to flourish. So please do see the film, recommend it to your friends, recommend it to the people who are not your friends. Many people need to see this and need to be engaged. I'm Michelle Goodwin. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. I'm going to invite back to join us the director, Erica Kahn, to close us out. Thank you so much, Michelle. This has been an incredibly, incredibly powerful panel. Thank you all to join, for joining and participating. I'm struck by all of your words. I'm very excited that everyone can watch this on replay over and over again, you can share. Um, this is accessible on Facebook on our, on our page, um, which is at Belly of the Beast Film. Sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social on Facebook, uh, also on Instagram at Belly of the Beast Film and on Twitter at BOTB Film to get the latest news about future panels next weekend. We'll be having a panel on reparations with California Latinas for Reproductive Justice, California Coalition for Women Prisoners, and the Disability Rights and Defense uh, Fund. Um, we will also be having a panel on reproductive justice on the ballot with Patrice Colors. so please join for these incredible panels. And finally, in addition to this being the opening weekend for the film, it's all the, also the opening weekend um for the mary j blige song see what you've done um which is an original song for the film you can find it on spotify and uh i really invite you all to to continue to share the film and the song thank you all congratulations erica thank you kelly thank you danielle cynthia don lady thank you all